paracrine agents. Um, we'll also talk about um, pain relievers and fever reducers in this um, little lecture. Okay, so this is the very last lecture of um, homeostasis. And I just wanna talk about paracrine agents in a little bit more detail and also how we manipulate paracrine agents with some medications. So as I mentioned before, paracrine agents are released to talk to their neighbors. Um, kind of a good way to approach thinking about paracrine agents is that inflammation, um, response to infection, um, swelling, those things generally start out local. Um, and they start out by one cell getting damaged and telling its neighbors, hey, um, heads up, I got damaged, there's something here or whatever. So um, this is intrinsic communication. So I want to introduce you to the categories of paracrine chemicals and then talk a little bit about the drugs that we use to manipulate these paracrine chemicals. Okay, so what kinds of things should be local and not body-wide, right? So hormones can have body-wide effects. These I want to be local. So um, growth factors and what which one cell tells a neighbor cell that we actually need to go through cell division. I don't need the whole body to go through cell division, but for instance, if there has been damage to the liver and the liver needs to regenerate some liver cells, you just tell your neighbors. What about blood clotting? Do you want blood clotting to be global or local? You want blood clotting to be local, right? Just near the site of damage. So you use paracrine chemicals to communicate to the cells in the area, okay? Um, and then um, how about allergies? So if I snorted up something that I was allergic to, um, do I need to tell the entire body instantaneously? So I've got like seasonal allergies right now and maybe some of you guys do as well. Um, histamines are paracrine agents that are released by basophils, um, among other things, uh, which is a type of white blood cell. They're also released by mast cells during the allergic response. And what they can do is say, hey, shrink these nasal membranes, um, cause some secretions, right? Um, that is a local response. We don't need it to be a body-wide response, just cells communicating with their homies. Okay, and then cytokines. Um, cytokines are chemical messengers that are released from a whole bunch of different kinds of cells, especially white blood cells. They are part of the body's immune response against pathogens. And um, some of them, um, so immune responses, by the way, localized immune or defense responses usually need to start out local because the damage or the infection started out locally. Now, cytokines, though, are famous for being released in such large quantities that they actually eventually get picked up by the bloodstream. And it's not always that they do that, but cytokines can. So what can happen is you can start out with a local infection that, for instance, makes your whole body tired or a local infection that makes you get a fever. Um, there are some cytokines that have been used for therapies for both cancer and HIV, um, interferons, there's interferon therapy in which they figured out how to make some of these cytokines um, that launch your immune system, help your immune system, figured out how to make them in the lab. Now they can use them as therapies for specific things. They haven't developed interferon therapy for all cancers. Okay, and interleukins, the word, um, L, the prefix or root LEU tells you that it comes from white blood cells. Okay, and then the last category that I wanna talk about are a category of paracrine agents that are called eicosanoids. And eicosanoids are important to you, even though you don't know that they're important to you. It's a big category of paracrine agents. There's like tons of different kinds of eicosanoids. Um, what they have in common, let me show you, is that they are all derived from membrane phospholipids. And of course, you guys know that every single cell that you have has phospholipids in the membrane, right? And so what you end up with is, you end up with these guys down here. These four down here are all your eicosanoids. And they are all derived from um, membrane phospholipids, which um, make arachidonic acid. You don't have to remember the entire pathway. Um, the important parts are in your notes. I'm just going to try to make the pathway make sense to you. And so let's talk about the three different categories of these guys. 
four different categories, sorry, of these guys. So first um, we have, um, no, I'm gonna put them into three categories. Um, this category called the leukotrienes, which are right here. And LEU tells you, leuco tells you that it probably comes from white blood cells and it does. Okay, so these are um, paracrine agents derived from membrane phospholipids um, that are involved in the inflammatory response and the immune response in an injured tissue. So first, let me tell you that if you haven't had this part of immunology, um, inflammation is both the first step of healing and it also can, if it goes crazy, um, cause damage. And even if it doesn't go crazy, it can sometimes cause pain. So both good and inconvenient. And then if it just continues to go on, it can be bad. Okay, so that's your leukotrienes. The next category are going to put these top two, nope, not the bottom two, um, prostacyclins and thromboxanes together. I'm gonna lump those together. They actually do slightly s separate things, but I'm gonna tell you that those two are primarily involved in blood clotting, which again is a local function, okay? And then the last category is the one that we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail, and it's called prostaglandins, these guys right here. Prostaglandins are just everywhere. They are paracrine chemicals. They're produced by almost all cells in your body. Different cells make different prostaglandins. There's at least 16 different kinds. No, you don't have to know the 16 different kinds. But I do wanna tell you a little bit about some of the functionality that prostaglandins can do. Depending on what part of the body actually releases them and um, in what concentrations, um, the prostaglandins can um, raise or lower local blood pressure and blood flow by causing local vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Hopefully that makes sense to you that that's a local function. Like just because one organ got hurt or was had a really high metabolic rate and needed more blood flow, it doesn't mean the whole body does. So raise or lower local blood pressure and blood flow increase or decrease gastric secretion. You can release different ones when your stomach is full that say more secretion than when your stomach is empty and say less secretion. They can enhance the inflammatory response that was um, also um, caused by leukotriene. So those kind of two kind of work together. Again, inflammation, first step of healing, so kind of good, potentially painful, mm, kind of uncomfortable, and also, um, if it continues to go on, in, inflammation itself can cause damage. Um, and then dilate or constrict the bronchioles, depending on whether it was something uh, that made you, uh, was released that made you want to get more air in or less air in. They can contract or relax the smooth muscle, digestive tract, smooth muscle, other places. They can shrink your nasal membranes. And then importantly, if they are released in large quantities, um, they can cause sedation and fever. These are second tier responses. Um, meaning that that's not what they do first. But if you dump a whole bunch of prostaglandins that are involved in all of these things into the bloodstream and they get picked up, um, they can cause sedation. So. Um, probably you have either gotten an infection bad enough that started locally that you ended up really tired because of it. Either you got a stomach flu and you got completely exhausted because it was stomach flu, even though of course it was primarily affecting your digestive tract or you got a respiratory ailment and you got so freaking tired because of it. All of those paracrine agents released over and over again don't stay local. They eventually get picked up by your bloodstream. Or um, they can also cause fever. Dump enough of them into the bloodstream, they will actually cause fever. And sometimes again, fever can be helpful um, to kill off the pathogens, also uncomfortable, right? Also, fever gets high enough, it's potentially damaging. So um, why talk about this? Well, because we actually manipulate these when we take Pain, pain relievers, antipyrogenics, which are like um, anti-fever medications, anti-inflammatory drugs, um, all of these have to do with this pathway that we're talking about. So um, 
let me teach you about aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and then I'll teach you about steroids. I won't actually go through um, acetaminophen in here, but I'll go through a, a bunch of the other ones. Okay, so how do aspirin and NSAIDs work? So what I mean is, so what, what kind of things do you take aspirin and ibuprofen for? You take them for pain, of course. You can also take them for fever, and you can also take them for inflammation and they actually work on this pathway. So here's what these do. Aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like um, ibuprofen and naproxen sodium, those block the synthesis of many of these eicosanoids, um, including the prostaglandins, because what they do is they actually inhibit the cyclooxygenase pathway right here. So what these guys do is, Right, let's hold on. Doot. Okay, so aspirin and NSAIDs. NSAIDs means non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. What those do is block the cyclooxygenase pathway, and because um, prostaglandins. Um, are involved in the inflammatory response and can lead to fever and can lead to pain. And then um, these two are sort of unintended by um, bystanders. I'll talk about those in just a second. So they reduce pain, um, fever, and inflammation. And that's part of the reason that we actually take them, okay? Because they block the pathway of paracrine agents that leads to um, fever, inflammation, and also pain. Okay, so they inhibit the cyclooxygenase pathway. Most of these are over the counter, but there are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, that you can get by prescription. Um, COX-2 inhibitors, they inhibit a specific type of cyclooxygenase. They're more effective than the over-the-counter medications. They also potentially have more side effects. There are even some lawsuits associated with them. Every once in a while, I will refer you to text boxes in your textbook, and those are worth reading if I tell you to look at them in your notes. Okay, and then um, what about steroids? So if you have a massive inflammatory condition, someone can pre prescribe you, for instance, prednisone or another massive anti-inflammatory drug. How do those work? Well, these work... Um, they're even more effective at blocking inflammation because they block phospholipase A2, which is at the beginning, and so they end up blocking leukotrienes, prostaglandins, and also these other two bystanders. So these are, um, we call them corticosteroids. You may not know that term yet, um, but prednisone is an example of one. Um, now, the interesting thing about these is that um, they have some unintended side effects, as of course almost everything does, because, um, see if I, I can make this make sense to you. What I'm trying to do in this whole story is block the synthesis or release of um, paracrine agents to reduce fever, inflammation, pain, but um, the steroid that is steroids that are really useful at doing it at blocking phospho, phospholipase A2 are actually mimics of hormones. So hormones have a whole bunch of receptors all over the body, and these steroids will end up having all kinds of side effects. So they can have weight gain and behavioral changes and um, water retention and all kinds of things, um, acne, all kinds of things go on with those. So it probably makes you think, well, why the heck would you use them? Well, because sometimes inflammation is so dangerous that the inflammatory response can either impact the quality of life or even life itself. So sometimes it's absolutely worth it to do that, but it's definitely not without cost. One last little tidbit about this is that I keep telling you that these innocent bystanders right here were affected. Um, those innocent bystanders, prostacyclines, um, cyclins and thromboxanes, those were related to um, blood clotting. Um, and so you probably know that both aspirin and ibuprofen, a little less so naproxen sodium, um, are impacted 
when you take a lot of aspirin or you take aspirin regularly or ibuprofen regularly. So um, you can, for instance, um, bruise more or bleed more when you do this. If you have um, a problem that also, or you're already taking an anti-clotting medication commonly called blood thinners, um, you have to be careful about what kind of over-the-counter and other prescription medication you take because that adds to the anti-clotting factor. Or sometimes you do it on purpose. For instance, I have a, a little cardiac abnormality that increases my likelihood of clotting. And so um, one of the things that my physician recommends that I do is to take a regular low-dose aspirin to reduce those clotting factors. So those are usually not what you're trying to treat when you're treating for fever or whatever. Okay, um, now what about an autocrine agent? So one last little tidbit. So this one isn't in your textbook. Sometimes it's talked about in textbooks and sometimes it, it isn't. So let me introduce you to the concept of an autocrine agent. It's really simple. I usually lump them in with paracrine agents. So if this is cell A and this is cell B and they're neighbors, they're probably going to have the same type of receptor. So um, we can assume that um, cell A has the same type of receptor as cell B and then sometimes what happens is that you end up talking to yourself. So this paracrine agent can actually activate a response in the cell that released it and then it's autocrine, auto as in self. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay, so um, that's not like what it is supposed to do, but sometimes cells can end up talking to themselves because they were trying to talk to a neighbor that was just like them. Okay, so that makes it an autocrine agent. Okay, so are there any situations in which you can talk between two cells without actually releasing anything into the extracellular fluid? Yeah, because you actually talked about um, these in anatomy. Okay, so here's cell A or, and cell B or cell one and cell two. Um, can they talk to each other directly without dumping anything into the extracellular fluid? Yeah, if they're right next to each other and stuck together by gap junctions, they can. So um, they can talk to each other. This is kind of a one trick pony because all cell one can tell cell two is what it already knows. It can't, for instance, say, I'm gonna stay alive, but I'm gonna tell you to go through ap apoptosis. So it's instantaneous, but it's like a single message that you can give because they really have to basically be doing the same thing. Those gap junctions, um, are good for causing a coordinated activity between a group of cells like waving cilia together or smooth muscle contraction in a wave or cardiac muscle contraction in a wave, but they're not very common um, in the human body. Um, they do allow for direct communication between cells without um, intercellular, without like chemical messengers being dumped. And it's usually teeny tiny things like ions that actually communicate between them. So um, in anatomy, you call these gap junctions. I don't know who decided to call it a connexon in physiology, but it's still a gap junction and I, that's what I call it. Okay, last little tidbit is how do you know um, whether something that you are looking at is um, a neurotransmitter or hormone, autocrine, paracrine? What determines? Well, a lot of people try to do memorization. Memorization is not very effective in physiology because dopamine can behave as a neurotransmitter if it's, for instance, released from a neuron right next to um, the receptor. Um, but it can also get dumped into the bloodstream and it can behave as a hormone or it can talk to its neighbor um, and then it's behaving as a paracrine agent. So how do you know what dopamine is? Well, you don't memorize dopamine as a neurotransmitter. You look at how dopamine is traveling and that's how you define it, right? Because it's really the functionality, not the rote memorization. So it could be a hormone if it's traveling through the bloodstream. Then we know it's not gonna be quite as quick to cause a response, but it's probably gonna last a little longer and be a little broader. It can be a neurotransmitter if it's released from a neuron right next to its neighbor, and then it's gonna have a really quick on, really quick off, and kind of a targeted response. Or it can be a paracrine agent if it's two non-neuron cells talking to each other, or it can even incidentally talk to itself, and then it's an autocrine agent. 
Okay. All right. Last little tidbit to tell you at the end of almost every set of notes, there is this little symbol right here. It's a rabbit looking down a rabbit hole because sometimes I find all kinds of cool stuff that I don't specifically put in lectures, um, but might be useful or interesting to you. So circadian rhythms, there's a morning or evening person kind of cool assessment to figure out how your circadian rhythms work. There's a TED ad about homeostasis, about why do we sweat. And then this one um, introduces you to body fluids, um, which we did at the very beginning of this set of notes. And then we're done with this one.